Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. God made everything and it was good. Our fellowship with Him was very good. But our rebellion shattered every relationship. Our sin brought the curse of death. We can see that things are not the way they are supposed to be. Our world is broken. We long for our redemption. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into our world. He lived and died and rose again before returning to his Father's right hand. Soon, Jesus will return. And every eye will see him, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb slain for sinners who overcame, and he will make all things new. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's go in our Bibles. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. This morning, we will be looking at verses 11 through 21. The title of the message, someone told me this week, best title of a message ever the return of the king. And if we uh, study through this text, you will realize it didn't take me much work to come up with a title, all right? <laughs> the sermon took a lot of work, but the title is just right there. It's all over this section, and so I really can't take any credit for that. The return of the king. We wait for this, we wait for this day with expectation. Perhaps you have witnessed uh, or you've seen a story of mistaken identity. Um, I loved the, the series, you know, different episodes of the undercover boss where the CEO of the company, the owner of the company, and they put on some, you know, <laughs> horrific disguise and they go work the, uh, you know, smallest part of their company and they, they move throughout their company and the whole plan was to take somebody from the, the bird's eye view and put them on the ground level and let's see what happens. Let's see how people treat customers and how they treat new hires and then at some point in the show, the CEO reveals, you know, hey, by the way, I own the company that you work for. And sometimes that worked out well. Sometimes it did not work out well when the uh, employee did not represent the company well. It made for very interesting stories to watch because we can all imagine that. We can picture here's the most powerful person in the company and he he or she takes the time to pay attention to the nobody in the company. There's something about that that resonates with our heart when someone who is usually easily separate from everyone else and they come down and they become one of them. I saw one of the greatest soccer players in our day and he went in disguise. Ronaldo. And they decked him out, man. He just looked like he just rolled out of a, a corner of a street somewhere, and he took a soccer ball with him into the, into the square. And he had the soccer ball, and he just looked like a bum. And there he was, and he would pass that ball to people just walking by, and all of them were too busy except a kid. And some kid stops, and I don't recommend this, that we you know, play with strangers in this way, but this kid stops and kicks the ball back to him, and so they engage a little bit, just back and forth, and everybody's watching. And then he stops and he kicks the ball up and he takes out a marker and he begins to autograph the soccer ball and the kid's like, you know, I'm not sure what's going on here. And then he hands the ball to the kid and takes off his disguise and then they have the hidden cameras that are watching everybody around and then everyone's like, well, I would have played soccer if I would have known it was you. 
And they're looking at it like I missed that opportunity, but I didn't know it was Ronaldo. I would have not walked by and been offended that you passed a soccer ball at me. And that little kid is just beaming. Here's a soccer ball, little buddy. You played soccer today with one of the greatest soccer players maybe of all time. If they would have known that was him, of course they would have played. Unless maybe they were a fan of another team, they might not have. Loved ones, the identity of Jesus of Nazareth has not been concealed. It's been announced by the angels, foretold in the Old Testament that he would be born where he would be born, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would live a sinless life, that he would then minister to countless individuals. He would preach the gospel of the kingdom for three years, and then he would lay down his life. He would suffer at the hands of the Roman government, betrayed by his own people, and he would be crucified, buried, but then he would rise again the third day. And then he promised to return that he would come back. Now we have been studying in this whole book of Revelation the full disclosure of who Christ is and how everything is going to turn out in the future, in the end. Nothing is hidden that we need to know for life and godliness. There are plenty of questions that I have that I do not have all of the answers to, but the Word of God is clear. Everything that I need for life and godliness is right on the bottom shelf. There's nothing hidden that we need to know to be ready for His return. So just imagine with me for a moment the sheer joy an honor and privilege that it would be. It's often an honor to introduce someone. Maybe they're receiving an award. And you get to announce them. Imagine the joy and honor that it would be to announce the arrival of Jesus. That's what we're studying here. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. To come out of the message from last week, here comes not the bride, here comes the groom. And it is breathtaking. John penned these words so that everyone can be ready. Everything has been done for you to be ready for His return. Will you be ready? Jesus is the Lamb, but He is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation chapter 19, we'll begin in verse 11. John says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness He judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them or shepherd them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast 
and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured. And with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is the Word of God. This is the testimony of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy that we saw back in verse 10. Oh, this morning, loved ones, the main desire I have in proclaiming this message is that you do not miss the unveiling of Christ. That you behold in a positive sense that you're ready for the unveiling of Christ. That you would be ready. Don't miss this. Don't miss the return of the King there's a, a timeline that'll come up here on the screen. Here's where we are. I just cut right to it. The return of Christ, Revelation 19, these verses 11 through 21. The return of the, the king. Let's be ready. Don't miss the unveiling of Christ. Number one, we see here to be ready. Behold the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Behold the supremacy of Jesus Christ. John says that this vision is from heaven. Heaven's opened. Chapter 4, a door was open in heaven. But now he says, heaven is wide open. And behold, look at what John sees. He gives a great description of the Lord. Uh, now some of you that are note-taking a verse, you know, and you look at this, it looks like a lot of information. But I encourage you to take notes. Don't just listen to this. Your memory probably isn't as good as you think it is, all right? I encourage you to take the worship guide, get it out, get a pen, and jot this down because this is a boiling down, a succinct description of what John gives to us about the Lamb of God, about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And then we're able to look at this and it grows us in wonder and in worship. As we think about what John saw and what he delivered to us, first of all, we see that he is glorious. He is absolutely glorious. That Christ will return and he will be riding on a white horse. There's just something beautiful about this. Then I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it, better than the white horse. It's incredible. The scene is beyond our comprehension that Jesus is coming on the clouds and He is glorious. Now, when Jesus entered Jerusalem before His betrayal, He rode in on what animal? Come on, class, making sure. It's a rainy day today, all right? Making sure you're with me. On a donkey, okay? He rides in on a donkey, and it's a symbol of peace. It's also a symbol of royalty. But coming in on a white horse, it's war imagery. This is majestic. This is powerful. Every prophecy has come true about Jesus or is coming true right now or, listen to me, will come true. Everything's said about him because it's all about Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. Paul says in Jesus. That is why through Him, it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. It's all Christ-centered. We even saw it last week. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's all about Jesus. He is the yes and amen. He is also not just glorious. He's faithful and true. We see that. He's faithful and true. That's what he's called. This is his divine attributes. God in Christ, He is faithful. It's not limited to just what He does 
but it is who he is. So because he is faithful, then everything that he does is faithful. He is faithful. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are, anybody find company with Paul here? Faithless? Oh, us of little faith. If we are faithless, if we struggle in that, he remains what? Faithful. For he cannot deny himself. It's who he is. Romans 10.11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him puts their faith and trust, however weak, however just fragile your faith is upon the authority of the word of God. If you put it in Christ, Paul says, not one person will be put to shame. Not one person will be let down or disappointed. Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus? He is faithful. Oh, I want to be faithful, but there are times when I'm faithless. There's times when my faith is weak. I love the prayer. Oh, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe, but oof, i got a long way to go. He is faithful and he is true. It is impossible for God to lie. It goes contrary to his character. He is faithful and he is true. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. He's faithful and true. He is also the righteous judge and warrior. He's the righteous judge and warrior. He's righteous. Everything that he does. And we've talked about this. We've looked at this even in our small groups and we've talked about how does the judgment of God, the wrath of God, how does that sit with us? Now, first of all, he's not asking for my opinion. But how freely we offer our opinions, don't we? But again, the Bible says, let God be true and every man and their opinion along with them, if it goes against contrary to God, it will be found to be lacking. He is the righteous judge and he is the righteous warrior. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. He is perfect in all of his ways and he will bring justice and he will bring retribution. He will make all things right and beautiful in his time. Not in your time and not in my time. In his time. So we trust him. Rest in his righteousness. Trust him with the outcome of every situation. This is why we're able to let offenses either roll off our back. It's okay. Love covers a multitude of sins. Or we let those offenses roll up to God in prayer. Lord, you know the situation and you judge righteously and I don't. I want to, but I don't often get it right. So I'll trust you with the outcome. Paul writes in Romans 12, 9, Beloved, oh, loved ones, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I wonder, do you have to always be known to be right? If somebody crosses you, do they go on a list that you don't forget them? If they offend you with their opinion, how does that sit with you? What do you do with that? How long do you hold on to that? Trust me from the teaching of the word of God, from the experience in my own life, to let things roll up to God and let him be the one. It can bring restoration and fellowship in relationships that you thought were long gone when you're not the one being the prosecutor, trial judge, and jury and executioner. No, that belongs to God. And he's been, can I remind us all, how merciful has he been with you and me? I don't deserve to be standing here today. You don't deserve to be sitting here today. None of us deserve this holy and awesome and righteous God to be good to us. But in love and in mercy and in grace, he has poured out his mercy on us. He is also holy. And we see in verse 12 that his eyes burn like fire. 
God sees all. He knows all. He is holy. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that is hidden from His sight. His eyes behold the evil and the good. He bears it all up, the weight of our sin, the good times, the bad times. He sees it all. God is entirely separate from sinners, which what it, that's what it means to be holy. That's where we begin, even in sharing the gospel, to help people identify their need. It, it doesn't even start with us being great friends with them. That may not move the ball. We must represent Christ well, but we must begin with the holiness of God. It is his attribute that is underneath and defined through all the other attributes. Because he is holy, he's merciful, just, gracious, eternal. He's holy. He's completely separate from us, which is why it is so fundamentally important that Jesus became one of us. That he, as Luther said, sunk himself into our flesh so that he could go through life and live the life that you and I could never live and die the death that you and I deserve to die and defeat the enemy of sin, death, hell, and the grave and Satan himself that you and I would have no chance again against without Christ. Let this, let this permeate your heart that he is holy, that he sees you right now, and he doesn't just see you in your good moments. He sees you in every moment, in every season. He sees your strengths, your weaknesses, your successes, and your failures. He sees when you do right, and he sees when you and I do wrong. And his love does not go like a roller coaster on us. It isn't up based on our performance and down and up and down, up and down. And how are you doing? God is not like a yo-yo attached to my behavior. I am absolutely and forever grounded in his grace and in his goodness and in his, gl and in his glory. Because of Jesus. He is holy. He beholds all. Everything that we not only just do, but everything that we think. He understands our motives. And often, if we're honest, I want my motives to be right and righteous. But I would be lying to say my motives are always right and righteous. And He's faithful, and He's patient, and He's merciful. But do not confuse that God is a man upstairs or that Jesus is some docile individual that never called sin, sin and never preached a, a, a message of judgment and hell. He absolutely did. He sat in mercy with a woman at the well in John 4 and he addressed her sinful life, but he did it in a way that was compassionate and it made her thirsty for living water and forget about the physical, literal water that was at the bottom of that well. Jesus has all authority. We see in verse 12 that many diadems or crowns, the, the victor's wreath that would be placed on a champion's head, and he comes with many crowns. On his head are many diadems. That is, he is exalted over the nations, over all peoples, just as was prophesied by Isaiah. He has all authority. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it just sits he shoulders it all. 1851, Matthew Bridges wrote the hymn. He penned these words, Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. And then this word, hark, all right, listen. Uh, it's the idea of when someone's talking and you lean in and you listen, hark, listen. 
Hark how the... <clears throat> Just take a little drink right here. <laughs> Clear out that 1851, okay? Let me try that from the beginning. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king. How long? Through all eternity. That's why we don't turn worship down. We, we turn it up. We lift up these praises because we're not calibrating to the people who dwell on the earth. We're calibrating and the Lord is recalibrating our hearts to the hymn of heaven. And it's not quiet and it's not muffled. It's not hushed. Crown him with many crowns. Letter F, he is indescribable. He has an undisclosed name, verse 12. Now as saints, we have the name of God upon our foreheads. We see that in Revelation 7, 9, and 14. And here Jesus has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. If forever he will be identified with his people because he made possible our salvation. Both the believers in the Old Testament, sometimes people ask that question, how did people get saved in the Old Testament, Pastor? By grace, through faith, trusting on Messiah Jesus to come. Okay? That's how they got saved, not by works. And then they lived out in obedience to the faith that God had given them. How do we get saved? By grace, through faith, looking back to what God has done in Christ 2,000 years ago on the cross and in the resurrection. That's how we're saved. That's how we've always been saved. Now, if, you have, if you've never seen the video of S.M. Lockridge, he's a, he's a preacher, and the story goes that behind, he, someone looked out at the close of a pastor's conference and they saw S.M. Lockridge in the back and they said, Brother Lockridge, please come close in prayer. And if you get on YouTube, it's a good thing, in this regard, look up S.M. Lockridge, my king. And you listen to how he goes through a description of Jesus. And I'm, I'm glad he's already passed on and he's in heaven. Otherwise, you'd probably be like, could we get him as a pastor in this church? Because, you know, wise, we kind of like him. He's all right. He's been here a while. Don't know what to do with him. But Lockridge... If that's what that guy just overflows with in a prayer at the end of a meeting, come on now. But I, I draw your attention to his, my king, because after he's going through punch one, two, I mean, he's just, he's just laying on the blows of who Jesus is. He says, oh, I wish I could describe him to you. After he's been describing him for about five minutes. And he says, oh, I wish I could describe him to you. And it's a play on, you can't, you cannot fully describe and encapsulate the glory of Jesus. He's indescribable. He is all powerful. He's clothed, John sees him in verse 13, in a robe that is dipped in blood. This alludes to his own crucifixion, his own death. And he defeated death, hell, and the grave that had no claim on him. But it also reminds us of his, of his robe bearing the stains of judgment. And that connects to the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah 63. He is all powerful. I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. Who is this one? Who is this all-powerful judging one who comes with a robe that is dipped in blood? And understand, this is the judgment that you and I all deserve, but he, he endured the wrath of God. His blood was shed for sinners. And he atoned for our sin 
And he said in the Great Commission, he said in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given to me, it's all mine. When we studied through Revelation 4 and we see the praise of God and then we see Revelation 5, who is worthy, who is worthy to take the seal and the lamb receives praise that is right there with praise that is given to the Father. He's worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. He is the living word of God we see in verse 13. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The Word of God. This is where John, in his gospel, begins. Okay, John's gospel was written later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He writes it as an older man. He has a motive in the, in the gospel to communicate the truth of the divinity of Christ. And he begins in verse 1, John 1, 1, in the beginning. Sounds very much like Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning was, and here it is, the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eternality of Christ. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, without Jesus, without the word, without Christ, was not anything made that was made. In him, in Christ, in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It cannot comprehend it. It cannot overtake it. Light always wins over darkness. Amen? Always. Hebrews 4.12, the writer of Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and active. Okay, it's the word of God. It's not human philosophy. It's not man's earthly opinions or wisdom. It's the word of God that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of your heart and my heart. And his eyes are the eyes that burn like fire. And he pierces all the way to the core of our being. And yet he chooses to be merciful to us and love us. Psalm 138, verse 2. I bow down, the psalmist says, towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your, what? Your name and your word. Your name and your word. That's Christ-centered. What do we exalt? What do you exalt? What do you exalt over everything else? If it's not his name and his word, then it will let you down. It will fail you. He is in command. We see this. He's in command and the armies of heaven come with him. See this in verse 14? Now John looks and he sees what's coming behind this this commander, this warrior, this judge, this savior, this ruler, the faithful and true. Here come the armies of heaven. He sees them arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. These soldiers are all coming on white horses, Loved ones, if you are in Christ, we will be coming with Jesus, but understand, we're just with him. We won't do any of the fighting. The outcome is not depending on how good you and I are with a sword. I mean, we can't run with scissors, right? Don't run with scissors. He comes with a sword from the mouth, which is his word, and we're just with him. Ephesians 6 says, For a believer, our our only weapon is the Word of God. That's the sword of the Spirit. That's what cuts inside like we talked about last week, and it takes down wrong thinking, and it builds up right thinking. It's It's like a scalpel in the hands of a surgeon. And how careful they intend to be to take out what is wrong And it brings cleansing and opportunity for healing for what is whole and what should be there. And they have to just rightly cut right between those and be so careful and so cautious 
That's what the word of God does, only it's not to our flesh. It's absolutely to our spirit, to our soul. He is the truth. Here we see the sword is coming from his mouth. He is the truth and his word cuts deep. This, sh- this sword is sharp and with it he will destroy his enemies. Remember we looked a few weeks ago, the breath of his nostrils? Just the breath. I don't know if anybody's been working on that and practicing that. But just the breath of his nostrils. Martin Luther. It must be Martin Luther Day. It is Reformation Month. We'll talk about it Saturday, guys, in our 8 o'clock study. I encourage you to be there. Verse 3. I, I bring this, this section up for the final line. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. You ever feel that way? Uh, undoubtedly. And PNG, with, with just right there in your face where you guys are. It's a little more disguised in our culture. It comes across differently. But it's just as evil. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph where? Through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. Why? For lo, his doom guaranteed. It's sure. That wasn't the wrong answer. Those of you who are starting to leak out the sure, okay? It wasn't wrong. Why? One, I love this, one little word will fell him. Doesn't even take a big word. Just one breath of the nostrils. That's it. One little word and it's over. Done. No contest. He is the truth. He is the governor. And he rules with a rod of iron. That's an unbreakable rule. It's an unbending rule. His reign and his rule will be irresistible. He is righteous and he will not bow and he will not bend or yield to the carnal desires and the intense pressure that often is applied by people around us, in our society, in our family, in our culture. He will stand and deliver righteousness for his people This will take place throughout the millennial kingdom. It's a righteous rule. Now we're in election season and there is no Messiah on the ballot in a few weeks. Okay, so let's be clear about this and we talk about this. This this, this is important as believers. The statistic of believers that vote is dismal if, 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 if it is an accurate statistic. Okay, we are primarily citizens of heaven. But we are also citizens here where the Lord has placed us and planted us. We have a responsibility. Do not shirk that responsibility. To vote is simply to make a choice. You have a choice. And again, you are not choosing between someone wholly perfect and true and and someone else. We have a choice coming up in an election, local, national. So we need to be doing our homework. You're not choosing a pastor that has biblical qualifications. We're not choosing a savior. But we are called to choose as believers, if we name the name of Christ, to choose which candidate, and this is what you have to decide, which candidate will do the most to protect life? Which candidate will do the most, and I can't say everything, because that's clear on both sides. There's different commitments. To protect marriage, to protect freedom, to protect liberty, liberty that comes with personal responsibility. That's what's before you and before me. There isn't a perfect candidate, I'll say it again, but there is a clear distinction. So keep in mind, though, that our political, our political neighbors and coworkers and maybe family members, they are not our enemies. They are not our enemies. And also, that the gospel will go forward regardless of who is in the White House next year. 
Make no mistake, often in persecuted countries, the gospel goes forward more boldly because you can't play games and fake to be a Christian. It costs too much. Your life is on the line. So loved ones, let me exhort you as your shepherd. Study. Do the work. Vote as biblically as possible. But let me borrow the words from another pastor who said this. If people know you more for your political party than they do for your Savior, you're getting it wrong. It's easy to get fired up, whether it be from the left or the right or the middle or wherever else directions come from. But if people know us more for who we're voting for than who shed his blood to redeem us, if we get more passionate about that than we do about the souls of men and women and the people around us, we need to say, Lord, forgive me and help me to keep a right view and a righteous view because I'm not going to forget that Jesus is the governor and he rules with a rod of iron. And I won't really vouch for anybody that's in a political office because I don't know him and I'm not God, so I don't even have to do, worry about that. The Lord will take care of that and he will right all wrongs. He is our avenger who will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, verse 15. Here we see it again. The wrath of God, God the Almighty. He's our avenger. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, it abides on him. It remains on him. If you're here without Christ, understand your situation. The wrath of God is abiding. It's resting over you. And the only thing that's keeping you from a sinner's hell, from a devil's hell, is the grace and mercy of God. That He is sustaining you giving you another opportunity again today to hear and respond to this message. Paul said, Romans 5, 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. How are we saved? Because the wrath fell on Christ. And it should have fallen on me. He is our King of kings and Lord of lords. It's written on his robe and on his thigh so that everyone finally, oh, that's who he is. He's the sovereign king of kings. There's no king greater than Jesus. He's the Lord of lords. Kurios is that Greek word which means master. Remember the night. The disciples are in the boat, Matthew 8, 23. They got into the boat. His disciples followed him, verse 24. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up saying, Save us, Lord. We are perishing. We're going to die. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Master, master, we perish. And he speaks, and the winds and the sea obey him. He is also victorious over all of his enemies. And this takes us from verse 17 down through the end of this chapter. And he sees, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called out, and he is victorious. He'll defeat all earthly kings and kingdoms. This great supper of God was about to be served for the birds of the air, and I'm reading that, I'm thinking, I remember that threat that Goliath had for David. Come here, little boy. I'm going to feed you to all the birds of the air today, you little whippersnapper, pipsqueak. Come on, right? Goliath didn't see it coming. He didn't see David's God. The point of that is not to be more like David. It's trust in David's God. That's the point. He'll defeat all kings of the earth and their kingdoms. Done. One little word. Done. He will defeat and confine the beast and the false prophet. Here they come, right? These powerful individuals like, (laughs) locked up, done. Next. Next. You see how that just downplays it in a moment. Here comes all the forces of hell. Done. No contest. 
And all of those people that have been deceived, all of those people that put their faith and trust in some human leader or human philosophy will be slain by the sword of truth that comes from the mouth of the Son of God. All lies, all enemies, vanquished by his breath, by his word. His word created all things. His word hold, holds all things together. And by his word, judgment will fall. And it's what we all deserve. Secondly, and you're thinking, wow. That covered that whole section. Don't miss the supremacy of Jesus. Secondly, the testimony of the Apostle John. Okay, because we're studying this. How did we get this? Okay, what happened to this guy? His testimony, well, first of all, in his gospel, we, we see the record that in the gospels, how Jesus called, and originally John was called as a fisherman to be a follower of Christ. Come follow me, John. Leave your nets. Come follow me. Follow me, John. And then he was called by Christ to be an apostle. And we think, that'd be awesome. He called me to be a follower. And then he, he, if, if you were John, he made me to be an apostle. I'm in. I'm one of the 12. This is amazing. This is incredible. The son of thunder became an apostle of love. He was completely transformed by Jesus. But lo loved ones, he was also called to suffer. He suffered greatly. That's how we have this letter. Chapter 1 on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was called to be a sufferer and as a witness for Christ. He experienced persecution, but he also experienced the glory of the presence of the Lord. And here it is, he left us a record. He left us a record, he's a witness. And he passed it on, he was faithful as a witness. He gave us the Gospel of John as a record that's focused upon Jesus as the Son of God. He gave us the epistles, the letters of John that focus upon God's real transformative love and the truth. And then what we've been studying, the book of Revelation, focused entirely upon the unveiling of Christ and his supremacy and his victory, victory over all things. That's how we're here. But thirdly, I want you to see the legacy of church, his, church history. Because this is, if you're in Christ, this is your story. This is your family heritage. This is your lineage. It's our legacy that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He promised the Spirit. And he said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now I want that picture. I have it bolded on purpose there. Start out in Jerusalem. That's where you live. You're going to move out to Judea and then out to Samaria where the Samaritans are. And then where will this gospel stop? Never. Going to the end. All peoples. End of the earth. So Jesus promised the Spirit, then he ascended. The church was born of and empowered by the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. It was on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit came. Earthquake. Crowd gathers. Peter preaches. And it's on. And we see the whole record of Acts through Revelation that the church was obedient to the Spirit. What is the record then of the Spirit's power and ministry in the life of the church. This is our history. On the screen will come emphasis to these sections, and we're just going to fly through the book of Acts. Acts 2.41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Acts 2.46. And, that, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their fruit, food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 4.4. 4. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Do you see what's happening? Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the, spirit, the, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God, how? With boldness. Acts 5.14, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes, see what's happening here? Of both men and women. Acts 5.41, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted, to wor counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ 
is Jesus. Acts 6 7. The church responded by setting seven men to serve as deacons. And the word of God continued to increase. And the n- number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Hear that? A great many of the priests, not just priests, not many, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Acts 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them that the Christ, proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he had for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. And it's the city of the Samaritans. Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. See what's happening here? This is all in Acts. Acts 9.31. This is after the conversion of Saul. He began to preach. Verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It, what happened to the church now? It multiplied. Acts 9.35. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Two, two towns, turned to the Lord, Acts 9.42. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord, Acts 10.44. Peter's preaching here in Joppa. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out, even on the, what group of people now? Gentiles. Come on in. His family's getting bigger, Acts 11.21. And the Lord, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Acts 12, James is dead now. Peter was supposed to be dead, but instead Herod uh, lost him in the prison. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Herod died, but the word of God, it's rolling on. It's increasing and multiplying. Acts 13, verse 40 Uh, This is the Gentiles, verse 49, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. You see what's happening? Acts 15, 41. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches are now planted. It's not just a church. It's churches, Acts 16, 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. This is the work of the Spirit in the lives of believers, Acts 19, 10. This, it's the preaching of Paul and Apollos. It continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, Acts 19, 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail how? Mightily. Are you with me on that one? Acts 19, 20. One more screen. There it is. Maybe. All right. Maybe not. Acts, 8, 20, uh, Acts 28. Therefore, verse 28, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Paul lived there. This is where the whole book of Acts closes. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all what? Boldness and without hindrance. You hear what happened? We just read through in a cursory way over the book of Acts and it started in Jerusalem, started with the disciples and now when the, when the lights turn out on the record that Luke gave to Theophilus and Acts, when it, where is Paul? He's right in the epicenter of the Roman Empire. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. How is that possible? The people of God were filled with the Spirit of God and they lived in obedience to the Word of God. How will that be possible in your life, in my life, in our community together as followers of Christ? It's the same way. Paul ends in chains, but the gospel is not chained. This is powerful. And it brings us to number four. In response to the return of the king, don't miss this. You and I have an opportunity, but opportunity is an invitation, okay? But that could be like, well, oh, that's nice. I'll think about that invitation. I'll see if I might get around to doing that. Oh, but it's not just that. We have an opportunity, but we also have, if you are a child of God, you have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to make this king known. 
You have an opportunity this morning, if you never have, to first of all trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard that message repeatedly in different ways from different people this morning. Have you personally turned from your sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? This is personal. No one can do this for you. Your parents cannot do this for you. They may love you and have done everything to make ready for you, but they cannot, they cannot bring you to a point of repentance and faith in Christ. That's personal. You have to do that. Your pastor can't do that. Nobody can do that. Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have, then you and I have a responsibility to take the gospel of Christ to all nations. We start at home and we don't stop till everyone hears. How many languages did you say are in PNG? Close to 900. And when are you going to have all those languages done by? I mean, come on now. And don't underestimate that it isn't services like this where someone young says, I heard that. And in the Old Testament, when the Lord said, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap who will go for me. And when Isaiah finishes with the holiness of God in Isaiah 6, he responds with, after he's purified, here am I. I'll go. What is God calling you? Where is he calling you? Be faithful in the little things. Start here. Start at home. And then where does it end? It doesn't end. Take it to the nations. And we do this together in partnerships. And let me ask you again this week, so who's your one? Who's the one that you're praying for? Will they be ready? Are you ready for the return of Christ? Will they be ready? That's the question for us, loved ones. To be ready. It's all here. John told us. He gave us the record. The question is, how will you respond? And that I'm not responsible for. You are. And you share the gospel with your coworker, your family member, however you fumble through it, stumble through it, or however it works. You share the gospel. It's the gospel. Plant the seed. And they are responsible for what happens. But if you and I don't warn them, if you and I don't tell them, guess who's responsible? We are. We have a job. And the job is not to make a deal. The job is to boldly, lovingly, sincerely, truthfully, faithfully, unflinchingly declare that Jesus, in fact, is your only hope. Period. He is your only hope. Put your faith and trust in the one who they thought they were done with when they put him in a tomb until the stone was rolled away and they looked inside and he's not here, the angel said. He's risen. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And if you put your faith and trust in him, death is an usher into his presence. That's all it is. It's no threat. Oh, bring this life-saving message to everyone. Will you stand with me? Oh, Lord, you are so good and so faithful. We can't have more of a Christ-centered message than what this text unfolded for us. You are revealed in your glory and in your goodness and in your power. And honestly, Lord, many people, maybe most people on planet Earth today, they do not see you the way you're revealed in Scripture. And they don't know your true identity. And they're living their lives separate from you. God, will you use us as your people, as your ambassadors, to bring the message of hope and life and salvation, repentance and faith to everyone wherever we go for all of our days. I pray for the one who may be here today and they have never stopped trusting in themselves that today would be the day they repent of that, that they would see that that is absolute pride and arrogance in the face of the Creator God to resist. And Father, may today they bow their life to you. And I pray, God, that you will use us as we, in a few minutes, go from this place, that we would, for all of our days, proclaim the glory and the majesty and the wonder of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you came to save 
us from our sins. You are absolutely glorious. And we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.